to be joined today by uh, master cinematographer Roger Deakins, as well as his collaborator and wife, James Ellis Deakins. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Hey, pleasure. Well, we didn't Glad really have a lot to do today. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Um, if you're new to the program, we're you know kind of in these uncertain times, hoping to kind of connect you as well as us with some of the people that make some of our favorite films possible um, through this show. It's a live interview series, kind of free willing. Um, today, you know, hopefully a lively chat uh, talking about the work that Roger and James have done over the years, some specific films, um, and, uh, you know, something that will hopefully lift some spirits because things are a little rough right now. Um, so without further ado, Roger and James, thank you guys so much. Um, I, you know, have a million questions to ask. Uh, but first of all, I, you know, I wanted to introduce you, James. I think um, people may not know uh, as much about you as they know about Roger. I was wondering if you could kind of talk about kind of your guys' working relationship and kind of what that workflow was like. Well, we basically um, work as a team and it starts from reading the scripts, discussing the scripts, um, talking with the directors and deciding whether to do it or not. And then as we go through prep, um, you know, I'm watching what kind of equipment we need, what days, and trying to keep track of that so if the schedule changes, I can let everybody know. Um, Roger's working on the lighting, and then uh, we work on the lighting diagrams together. And um, I am the liaison with the production, basically, so Roger can go and do what he wants, and so I'm constantly talking with them. And visual effects. I talk with visual effects a lot to, be, to make sure that they get what they want, but we can shoot it the way we want. So there's a lot of discussion sometimes, well, why do you want to shoot it this way, you know, if they're telling me something, and then figuring out a, a way to do it. Um, and also so they have someone during the shoot to talk to if they're worried about something and also so I can know if they're happy with everything that they have. And then I set up the dailies workflow. You always the, watch dailies, don't you? Every, yeah. every morning, James watches, watches the dailies, which is... Yeah, I great. watch the daily when we're actually shooting. Um, I go in and watch the dailies and come in and talk to Roger and maybe the director and say what I've seen. Um, and then as we're shooting, if there's issues that are coming up about something that's coming in the future, I'll run off and deal with that. Or if we have a technical problem, I'll research it and figure out what it is. Um, and when the producers come on set and want to ask Roger a question, he's a little um, scary when he's working on the set because he's so focused and no one wants to talk to him. Not scary. Yes, you are. <laughs> and so they'll ask me the question. I'll usually know the answer. And if I don't, I can go yeah. and tap him on the shoulder because he can't yell at me because he's got to go home <laughs> with me. So, And we have a shorthand anyway, so it's a lot yeah. faster. No, it's like it really is collaboration. It's like a team. It's a tag team, really. Yeah. You know, we both we both have the same. Same, you goal. know, goal and yeah, exactly. And so yeah, I mean, it's fantastic for me because basically James is 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 watching my back really and and dealing with all the technical issues as, as he says, the equipment, the, the 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 workflow of the digital image nowadays and the post production and everything. And she tells me where to be and when. <laughs> <laughs> pretty good no i just try and allow you to yeah. really focus on the on the visual and not be thinking about whether yeah. that crane's going to show up or something yeah, I you mean, know, just to think yeah. about what you're what you're yeah, shooting but so, so it's great you know we were we were sitting side by side on most of 1917 <laughs> which you know is mostly remotely operated so um it, it's just great to be able to be there with somebody and you know, talk it through and, you know, it's and a collaboration. Go home at night and talk about it again. And talk about it again. <laughs> All right, that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Stop already. Anyway, yeah, right. there we are. Yeah. Yeah, that's well, us. that sounds great. That sounds like an invaluable resource, um, yes. you know, because I'm, I'm sure the job of a cinematographer can sometimes be isolating and uh, overwhelming. You've got so much to do on the day. So. Yeah, I mean, it is great because I, I do tend to work with the same crew that I've worked with for many years. I mean, either in England or here, uh, East Coast, West Coast, is maybe different people. But and James knows them all as well. So it's like it is a bit of a family. It's our family, mm -hmm. which is a bit frustrating right now, not being <laughs> part of the family. Yeah. You know, but, but it is. We do. We miss them. I mean, it is. It is our, our family life. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have kids. And that, in a funny kind of way, that's that is our family. 
That's fantastic. Um, to kind of go back a little bit, uh, I mean, forgive the pedestrian question, but I am genuinely curious. I mean, Roger, I know you started out in um, photography and uh, in documentaries, but I was curious, like, were you always a film fan? Is that something you were always kind of passionate about and kind of what made you want to be a cinematographer? Uh, no, I was I was passionate about leaving home, I think. And so I went to art college because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, I applied to university, but I actually applied too late. I left it too late because I did it about what I wanted to do. So I ended up going to art college and it was like, the best decision I never made. I just went and it was the, the best non-decision because that really, um, that it wasn't that I didn't love film. I loved films as a kid, but uh, I, didn't ex I didn't see any way that would be part of my life other than going to the cinema or the film society, that they had a little film society in Torquay. Um, so, but it was art college that really kind of, showed me the possibility of, of what my life could be really and then didn't you discover still photography there i did i discovered still photography at art college i mean they put me in a graphic design course which i didn't want i wanted to be a painter you know a bohemian you know like you do at that age <laughs> but no, i discovered photography and i used to just hitch around the country or hitch to the town uh, some other town or something and spend the day taking photographs sometimes i'd sleep on a beach and just <laughs> wander around taking photographs and that, that that that's what started me off really and at the end of art college the national film school opened um north of london and um i applied with a friend uh, i didn't get in that year but they told me if i applied the next year i would get in and they would give me a place um so that Really, that's basically changed my life. <laughs> and we're all thankful for it. Um, oh, really, <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's, no, it's, it, was, it was great. I said it was a series of non-decisions because even applying to the National Film School, it was only a friend of mine that told me about it. And I thought, oh, yeah, well, that'd be nice. We'll apply together. And I got in and he didn't, which was kind of sad. But, yeah. you know, so it was, it was a lot of almost non-decisions really. I can't say it was, uh, I love film when I was 10 years old and that's what I spent my life trying to get to be, do, you know, it wasn't yeah. like that. Interesting. Uh, and James, what was kind of your entry point to the industry? Were you, uh, you know, a big film fan growing up as well? Well, I love films, but when I went to college, I had the mistaken idea that I was going to major in economics because I had <clears throat> done in um, high school a theoretical paper and I liked the, the kind of philosophy and the, uh, theoretical um, discussion. But then I got into economics and it was GNP and NNP and I, I act, absolutely hated it. So I ended up double majoring, doing an undergrad in Latin and then, uh, no, a graduate course in Latin and an undergrad in Greek. Um, just because I knew I would never do that on my own, but it wasn't what I wanted to do and I didn't want to teach. But while I was in um, in college, I did start doing multimedia shows for freshman orientation, junior transfer orientation, and then I did one on rape on, uh, rape on campus with um, these people that I did it with. And I really enjoyed creating that. So when I came, went out of, um, college and moved to New York, I got a job in a film lab, which, uh, at do art and worked there for four years. And it was really interesting. I, I was supposed to just oversee the, um, service department, but they gave me the title of supervisor. So all the, um, technicians from the bottom of the lab would come to me and say, well, listen, the CRI has Newton rings. Should we redo it, run it through the bath again, or just redo the whole thing? I go, Hang on, let me check. And, <laughs> what's and, a uh, yeah, right. Yeah, what's a CRI? <laughs> you know, and and go check that. So I learned a whole lot, but it wasn't wasn't a lot of a of a challenge to me. So I left it, and I was a post production supervisor, which is exactly the same thing as being in the lab, except you're the customer, so you're always right. But it wasn't anything new. So somebody said you should become a script supervisor, and I did, and. I think I love that job because it was impossible. So there's something wrong with me. <laughs> that I, I masochist it perhaps, but, um, and I did that for a long time. And then I met Roger on a job and um, 
who did the whole job professionally and then went out afterwards um, at the end of the job and got married. And we, I continued working as a script supervisor, but oftentimes we'd be on different films and we realized that we didn't, um, we didn't want that. So we, um, we did quite a few together, didn't yeah, we? we? Did, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, um, it's yeah. really a director's choice, that, yeah. you know, who does but, it. Um, so. But then it just felt natural, didn't it? That, yeah. that, that especially when digital workflow came in. Well, yeah. James is so much better with all that digital noughts and ones and all that stuff. Yeah, I'm I a don't gearhead. know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, I, I used to do it all, anyway, when even when we were doing film in the background, but yeah. it got really hard because it took three weeks to for the production to understand the way that we worked. Yeah. And so then I took a title and then I, but then if you take a salary, then they really pay attention to you. So. <laughs> Um, that's true. Uh, and now we just, we make no bones about it. We work together and that's it. You know? The thing about, you were asking about the question about always loving cinema. That, the thing is, way back then, I mean, I remember that we didn't have television. I mean, can you imagine that, let alone an iPhone? I mean, you know, I, like I was saying to you just now, I, I was logging on yesterday and seeing some Soviet films on my computer that I never knew existed. Now, when I was a kid, you never got that opportunity. Yeah, I remember yeah. I remember there was a little film club that opened in Torquay where I was brought up um, when I was like 15, 16. And it was in the winter, so you had nothing to do in Torquay in the winter. It's a summer town, you know, it's a resort town. So I went, I went to this um, film society. Um, must, have been, must have been 1965 because I saw Peter Watkins' War Game. And this is like the middle of the Cold War and nuclear holocaust was everything. You know, we at school, we were, you know, duck and cover and all that nonsense. And to see War Game, that, that really had a, I kind of, I mean, to say a profound effect would be going too far, but I'm, I, I've never forgotten seeing that film and the effect it had on me. And also Peter Watkins' Culloden that, um, that he made previously. And, you know, but you don't really connect that, that's something you could be part of. You see something that is, you don't know what it is. It just somehow, it's inspiring, but you don't know what to do with that inspiration. You know what I mean? <laughs> so now I think it's quite different because people are much more mobile. And yeah. you, you can kind of much, be much more open to those influences, I think. So I did love film growing up. I mean, I watched cartoons when I was four or five with my dad. He used to be able to rent reels of cartoons i watched felix goes <laughs> to the moon about a hundred times but to say that that was why i'm now in cinema i i don't know you know yeah yeah i think we're almost overwhelmed by choice now i mean the, literally yeah. anything is at your fingertips and so I, yeah. i'll be curious to see how that influences kind of the next generation of yeah you know, I don't, it's, i'm not saying it's any easier to get into the industry sure. i'm sure it's actually not because consequently there's far more people doing what I do, you know, I mean, it's, when I first started, it was, it was probably easier once you've got the experience. I mean, once I left the National Film, film School, it's probably easier than now, because there was kind of less, up, 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 there was less competition and the industry and television industry was just opening up. Mm -hmm. So there was, you know, more opportunity, I but think. What about person. also the whole thing about when you're shooting film, it's all in the black box and nobody but the cinematographer knows what's going on. Well, now no, not, yeah. with digital, I think because everybody knows Photoshop and everybody, yeah. you know, deals with digital things that yeah. um, possibly yeah. it's not as, you know, uh, intimidating to people. Right. No, I think I was going to say, I think there's good and bad about that. But yeah, I, I yeah, think no, mostly I it's good. I mean, I love digital and I love that collaboration and and I think gives us so many more people opportunity as you say to mm -hmm. to learn and experience it and find out what they really want to do you know I never picked up a film camera till I went to national film school literally never touched a camera so I don't I know that was really what I wanted to do <laughs> I was just lucky it was really. yeah. <laughs> well I was curious I mean the world like everything changed when YouTube came, came along and now you know there's U these YouTube videos of like you know Roger Deakins cinematography explained or like the best shots of all time um 
I try, and help, you, I try and say something different every time, so just to make people come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I was wondering how you, I mean, uh, you know, burgeoning cinematographers are looking at these and looking at, you know, these assemblies of like cool shots. How do you educate future DPs in, you know, just basic history and grammar of cinematography when right now it does sound, it seem to be a little focused on kind of like what looks cool or like what, like let's do this all in a one -er. Mm. You know, that, that, that's something I find that's kind of sad. I, I actually, I think this present situation is going to have an effect on movies because movies have become more about the aesthetics than they have about the story and the content and what the film's trying to say. I, I find that really disappointing and somewhat depressing, but I, I think that might change. Um, what I say to people is that yeah, you can, I mean, there's all these wonderful sites you can learn so much on, but in the end, you can only teach yourself, I think, you know? I mean, yeah. I certainly did. I don't know that I'm saying that I should be the, yeah. <laughs> the standard of how everybody does it, but I, 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 didn't, I didn't, nobody taught me. I just picked up a camera at a film school and started making my own films and and started shooting for other students and just did it. I mean, yeah, I, you kind of learn by watching other movies, but I never had tutorials. Nobody ever said, well, this is where you put the key light and then you've got to put the fill light here. And they always have a backlight. I, you know, you just do and learn it. You just learn from doing it. That's That was my process. And I think there's a danger now that that people think there's a there's a, some sort of magic trick that you can learn, you know, that somebody's yeah. going to tell you all, oh, we're going to do this, and I'll suddenly be a cinematographer. <laughs> no, no, it's not going to happen. <laughs> well, and and with the rise of digital, I mean, there are cinematographers who do like break it down into a mathematical science in terms of you yeah. know shots and the lighting and everything. Yeah. What are kind of your thoughts on that? And kind well, of doing some filmmakers do, some directors do. Yeah. And yeah. some directors work as though it's a mathematical yeah. formula. Um, and I always remember what John Huston says is you, you, you shoot with your gut, not with your head. I mean, I really believe that. But, but, some, but some people have different processes. Yeah, I mean, no, Some but, people <laughs> do that. You couldn't. It's true, but I find, those, I find usually those, I find those films a little dead. You know, they're, they're emotionally, you know, they're like an exercise, aren't they, often? Mm -hmm. You know, fine, but. Yeah, <laughs> I'm um, an emotional person. I think an emotional reaction to to something, you know. You know. Yeah, like gr good writing is an emotional reaction to something, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to kind of dig into a few films of yours, kind of specifically, um, and I wanted to start with Barton Fink, which I think is, uh, first of all, a fantastic film. But um, you know, it was your first collaboration with the Coen Brothers. But it's also working in this kind of, you know, it's not a, it's not an easy film to describe um, <laughs> in terms of like what right. is. So what was kind of that, like your first meeting with the Coen brothers and like dealing with, you know, understanding their vision and then uh, committing that to film? My agent told me exactly the same thing when when uh, they they I won't say who the agent was when when they <laughs> proposed this was it said said that this script had been sent and that Joel and Ethan had, were in, had inquired about me. Our agent said it's a very hard film to describe. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. It's like two different movies. Didn't they say it's and probably not a good idea? It's probably not a good idea. I said, no, come on, I got to read it. And who is it? The Coen Brothers. You must be mad. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, it, it, it's very bizarre. But you know, like a lot of Joel and Ethan's scripts, you read the script and it's you've got to understand them really before you can tell what that script's going to be like. I mean, especially. Think of Fargo. You read the original yeah. script of Fargo and you go, yeah. really? This yeah. is like... You hate the main character, I'm, I'm you think. To, yeah, I'm <laughs> supposed to kind of somehow connect with this main character. I don't know. But, but then, of course, yeah. you do. And you do, Because yeah. of the way they direct it. And it was the same with Fink, really. It was very interesting. I met, I met Joel and Ethan in uh, Notting Hill in London. They were in England. And, yeah, and I... I was very nervous because I'd, I'd, I'd seen um, 
um, Miller's Crossing. Uh, Miller's, no, not no. Miller's Crossing, the, uh, the first one. Arizona, uh, Raising Arizona. Before that, Blood Simple, oh, Blood which Simple. I thought was absolutely amazing, uh, you know. And um, I was nervous. And then I'm nervous with the idea of working with two people as a director. And But it was funny, right, in the conversation we were having over breakfast or wherever it was, it was like one would start a sentence and the other one would finish it. And it was like, wow, this is really interesting. And it was it was always like that, you know, when they worked together. It's like they they would finish each other's sentences and the the, the thought process would go from one to the other and back. It was but really interesting. At the same time, too, I, I forget what film it was, but um, before, you know, prep was even starting, they came over for dinner and um, I was at the stove cooking and they were sitting at the table and Joel said, well, you know, and Roger would go, yeah. And um, Eth. Eth would say, yeah. right. right. And, and I had no idea what they <laughs> were talking no about, but, they, but they, you all did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was great. And I'm, I must say, I, Barton Fink was really tough because we had a problem with the lab because we were using a lab in LA and I won't say the name because it's still going. Um, <laughs> you just did. <laughs> so I just did, really, didn't I? Um, but um, we had a lot of problems with the dailies. So we ended up sending dailies to New York, and that solved that problem because we went to do art, which I always work with, um, and they were fantastic. Um, but it was a difficult film but, um, for me, and I was very nervous about it. And How about the first day, that story? No, the first day yeah. was actually the first day was really a trip. Actually, it was interesting. <laughs> I, I spent I spent probably five weeks with Joel and Ethan in pre production doing storyboards, and but the first day of filming is like the opening of the film, where where John is stand John Turturro is standing in the wings of the theatre watching his play performed, and we'd done it we'd storyboarded it as a series of little cuts, you know, singles. But I, I, maybe it was a week or two before we started shooting. I said to I said to the boys, "Well, what if we combined it? What if we combined these shots and did a flowing shot that saw the the weight of the curtain go up and the that and the guy come out and shout and then come back and come to Detour, to Tura. And they said, "Well, yeah, okay." And um, so I got a Luma crane, you know, which they'd never worked with, uh, you know, remote operated. Luma crane and stuff and they were nervous so we set it up the day before the evening before we set it up for the shot and all the lighting was <laughs> and it was funny because the day of the shoot we came in did the shot in about an hour and a half uh well we certainly wrapped at like 10 30 in the morning 11 o'clock maybe and I said, okay, what are we going to do now? And they said, well, there's nothing we can do. <laughs> so we all went home at 11 o'clock in the morning on the first day of the shoot. Did they also take one and that was it? They yeah, were... it was take one. And I said, no, this is film, you know, digital, <laughs> you know what you got. But I said, this is film, take yeah. one. What do you mean? You You're going to live with more. that? <laughs> so we'd, I'd always argue for a second take. It became a bit of a joke that often I would be arguing for a second take and say, what do we need a second take? I was fine. <laughs> My nervousness, I guess. But yeah, we wrapped at 11 o'clock. That used to happen quite a bit, really, because you would think things would were going to take longer and then they didn't, you know. I mean, there were occasions where it took a lot longer than we thought and we'd be there a long shoot. But, but most days were yeah. quite... They often came up to you and said, Roger, can you stretch it out a little uh, bit yeah. so we don't wrap before lunch. Sometimes Ethan would say, slow down, slow down, Roger, because people will go without having lunch and lunch is all being cooked. <laughs> no, it was um it was it was all because we've done so much prep and we we're all so in sync and uh and uh, the crew I work with I work with a lot and you know everything was just like you know the actually doing it was fairly mechanical. Um yeah, it's kind of think was a wonderful experience actually and it was it was also a great technical challenge because we had to work things out like mm. how we would get the camera to go down the plug hole of a sink and then down a pipe i mean it's really bizarre things when you think about it <laughs> of course everybody does it now it's digital you can do it but <laughs> yeah but you guys are doing it the old-fashioned way um yeah you can animate it i do anything you want <laughs> <laughs> and then i mean uh, your collaborations with the with the Coen brothers are fantastic, but uh, you know, 
Fargo was a really big film for them and, and a really big film for you as well. I mean, it's a film that, um, you know, obviously the Oscar nominations and everything. Um, but also it just, you know, it, it's so different from what they had done before. And I was wondering if you could talk about, um, you know, where, what conversations kind of led to the style of that film and, you know, working with Snow, which I'm sure had to be challenging for you as well. Um, it's you know, funny you say it was a big film, you see, because mm -hmm. we'd just done Hudsnugger Proxy, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a big budget, Joel Silver, the whole bit, and it failed completely at the box office. So one day, Joel and Ethan said to me, they rang me up. What was that? I don't know where I was. Here. And they said, Oh, here was it. <laughs> and they said, uh, Look, we're doing this really little f film. I, we don't think you'll be interested. You know, it's okay. We'll work with you again. If you don't want to do it, it's fine. But it's a little film and we got no money. And after Hudsucker, that's the, we're going to sort of kind of like they were going to regroup. And I said, well, don't be daft. Don't be crazy. You know, don't be daft. Don't be daft. Yeah. Whatever, whatever, you know. And and um, yeah, so we went to do it. Do it. it was a very little film, very, very low budget. It was. Very, uh, we had a small crew. I remember there was a union strike in the middle of it, <laughs> which was really difficult. Um, no, but it was uh, it was tough. But I, again, I had the crew that I'd worked with a lot, forever. And, um, oh, except for Mitch, who was the key grip, who wondered, yeah. wondered if I was going to fire him, I think, after a few days. But <laughs> he didn't understand my english sense of humor i mean, that was a problem yeah but um no, it, was, it, it was it was it was that was a wonderful experience but um like we were saying before it was it was in, until you were kind of shooting it you realized the sort of tone of it the tone of bill macy's performance and like where it was going and yeah coming off hudsucker it was interesting because every every one of their films has a kind of different sort of slant especially visually and and they very much wanted this, and you can see from the title card or whatever it is on it, says this, you know, real story and all that, which is a bit stretching it. But <laughs> they wanted it to feel like a docudrama, you know, almost like it was. Um, not sharp off the cuff, but I mean, Joel mentioned one time, wanted it to feel like a Ken Loach movie where, you know, you put the camera in the corner of the room and just let things evolve in front of you. We didn't go that far. In fact, the first shot we did was a 120-foot tracking shot in the snow, <laughs> which was kind of quite right. against the whole concept of just being in the corner of a right room and panning. But, yeah. <laughs> but the feeling of it is actually there, the, the observational feeling. And we shot it all on a slightly longer lens than we certainly had done the Hudsack or Barton Fink. I mean, you know, it was like we were shooting on a 40 mil instead of oh, 35, 40, instead of like a... 25 or 21 or you know so it did have a different feel to it um but yeah it was great uh, the hardest thing about it was that you said the snow the hardest thing about it was there was very little snow that year in yes, Minnesota. Right. it was bitterly cold but a lot of the time we were making snow there's a scene where Buscemi's kind of changing the number plate of his car up on the an airport uh, airport car park and we had to make all the snow then, <laughs> there's no snow. And then when we shot all the night scenes with like the car chase, it's like we, every night, it was a few nights shooting, but every night we had to change locations because the first place we chose, all the snow had melted. So the last night we were like 10 miles from the Canadian border. <laughs> and we were saying, can we go into Canada? Oh my God, there's no snow. <laughs> it was really funny. Well, no, it was. It wasn't funny back then. That's more key. So you guys thought you were just making this kind of small, uh, you know, follow up to Hudsucker. How did uh, the kind of critical reaction and the awards and everything? Oh, it was great. How can yeah. you figure that? It's nonsense, yeah. isn't it? How do you figure that? I mean, <laughs> and then and then oh, to go on later, True Grit was like their most successful film. You know, yeah. I mean, nobody expected that. Yeah. I mean, True Grit was fairly small film, and the guys wanted to make a film that was more true to the original story the book yeah. you know and and nobody expected that to be such a success it was i mean i love the movie and i love fargo as well but you don't expect it to be that successful especially after i mean hudsucker i i, I still think hudsucker is an amazing piece of film really it's very imaginative i think it 
you know, if you released it today, probably people go, oh, yeah, that, they accept it more because there's a wider spectrum of kind of material out there. But I suppose it was so off the wall mm. back then. It was like, <laughs> everybody went, what the hell is that? You know? <laughs> I love it. Well, and speaking of surprises, I mean, around the same time you made the Shawshank Redemption, which, you know, you ask any random person on the street, there's a pretty good chance they're going to say that's their favorite movie of all time. Uh, was yeah, there anything? I think that when it was released in the cinema, because it totally <laughs> bombed. I know. It totally I know, it's shocking. They got 15 million <laughs> in two releases. They released yeah. it a second time because they thought, well, something was wrong here. That doesn't make sense. They released it a second time. It bombed again. You know, I think it was cable TV. I think that's that's how a lot of people saw that and, movie. And then yeah. and VHS, because yeah. it was back yeah. in VHS days. The yeah. whole year, it was like top of the charts on VHS. Yeah. And yeah. you think, well, what well, happened when it was in the cinema? Why, what's <laughs> you know, can you see it in the cinema? It's a pity, because I think it looks great on a big screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm, I'm glad it was sort of found. I mean, I, I it mystifies me how much... People go overboard about that film. I mean, I think it's a good film. I think it's a bit, in my taste, it's a bit soft. I don't think yeah. prison is quite yeah. that nice. You don't find your best <laughs> friend. Yeah. No, you don't find your best friend. Well, you, if you're lucky. I don't know. I've never been there. Thanks. Hopefully, I never will. But I've, I've, I felt it was a bit soft. Um, but you know, it's fantastic. It's done so well, and people still admire it, and it gets shown and. Yeah, I even watched it a couple of years ago myself. I don't know about that. <laughs> what was the experience working with Frank on that film and and kind of making a you know a prison cinem cinematic? I mean, there are Capra esque tones to it. Yeah, bit. yeah, I think that was very deliberate when when um, Frank wrote it. Actually, I think he had that kind of in mind. Um, it was kind of the first film he directed, so. Um, it was kind of a little chaotic at times, I have to say. Um, and it was difficult because we were we were shooting in um, a real prison most of the time in um, Mansfield in Ohio, um, outside of Cleveland. And um, it was a prison that had just been um, been in use up until about a year before. So it was quite a good nick. But we were, you know, it's a typical problem. You're shooting interiors and then you're shooting in the yard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was a kind of jigsaw puzzle of moving from inside to outside. And there was no way you could shoot inside without lighting the hell out of it. I mean, it was no light. I mean, and also, you know, you've got a very short shooting day if you had any light and you, whatever. Anyway, it was a real problem. So the rig to shoot the inside of like a mess hall and things was quite it's quite a we we got hmr lights from all over the country to do it and then of course we got through shooting some of our day interiors and they said now we've got to do this outside work because i don't know if it was an actor or something and i said okay so we're going to take all this scaffold down take all this lights all these lights and send them all back and then get them back again <laughs> yep i mean it was those sort of things were quite frustrating, I got to say. And, you know, it's, there was a, for me, okay, I'll be quite honest, I thought there was a lack of understanding about what it takes to do something like that. And, um, and we had another, we had a set, the main like interior courtyard with the, 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 the location didn't have this, this, all the cells looking out onto this interior courtyard. Um, so we built that as a, um, a huge set in a warehouse, which filled the whole warehouse right to within feet of the ceiling and maybe three feet. So that was a huge rig to light that. For night, it wasn't bad. It was all about little practicals, but to light it for daylight was a huge rig for a film that was of that kind of budget. So there was a lot of expectation on it. So there was a few fraught moments, really, trying to get to what one needed to do it. Um, but um, I remember it as a great experience overall. Um, yeah, I think yeah. the script had a really good structure oh, the script to was it. fantastic. It was yeah. really, and they stuck to the script, um, mm. as opposed mm. to changing things yeah. as you're shooting, which is always yeah. a recipe for disaster. Most of the shots, now and again, Frank would have a very specific idea of a shot, but most of the time we, we created the shots on the set with the actors. 
which yeah. I liked, you know, I mean, I shot documentaries for years, so I, I kind of like that way of working. I, I like either way of working, really. Story. I mean, we did work with the storyboard artists on ideas, but most of most of it was, I think there's actually a storyboard book of the whole yeah. movie. Hmm. But that only came out after the movie came out. That yeah. is not something that we had to work from. So yeah. it's kind of interesting, really. We did storyboard <laughs> quite a lot, mainly bit of the sort of actiony stuff. I mean, remember we storyboarded a whole scene with a warden throwing a prisoner off the rail into the, you know, onto the floor down four flights or whatever, and it was like a big scene, but we never shot it. Mm. And we, we it storyboarded a whole sequence after Tim standing there under the rain and the lightning once he's escaped. There was a whole sequence of him running across the field to the catch this train that was going by the prison. <laughs> we lit all the prison at night so you could see it and the train would come by and the smoke would be going up and it'd be back on this cart and there would be these hobos sitting in the car. And it was a wonderful, great scene. We storyboarded it, didn't shoot a single frame of it. You know, because we just didn't have time. It was just there's no way you could get to it. So it was uh it was interesting. Interesting. Oh, well, I mean, one little story I must say of oh, talking yeah. about that not understanding uh, what it takes to light something like that. Um, it was kind of a year or so later. I mean, that I got nominated for that at the ASC, oh, right. and I went I went to the clubhouse one day and met people I'd never met before, and it was like kind of amazing. The ASC uh, clubhouse. The ASC clubhouse. And I was listening to a conversation with people that didn't know who I was. And I, I knew who I did know who they were. And I knew them quite well later. Um, and the conversation was about um, the, the different work that year. And the one guy was saying, one very respected cameraman was saying, yeah, I'd have voted for Shawshank. That was definitely the best looking film, but there was no lighting in it. <laughs> And my mouth just <laughs> dropped wide open because if you see some see some behind the scenes shots of how much light it took to do that, it was like <laughs> kind, of, funny. kind of a back ended compliment, yeah. I suppose, in a way, wasn't it? Very much kind of, yeah. I laughed. I didn't say anything then, but I didn't ever say it to him actually, this guy. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you never really know. Um, uh, and I mean, speaking of populist films, another film that uh, just kind of exploded, kind of surprisingly, was Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Um, yeah. You know, that movie just really took hold. Um, but you obviously, you know, also kind of pioneered this kind of new digital color correction process um, on that film. I was wondering if you could kind of talk about the very strong look on that film. And I imagine you guys both worked together on this as well. It was a yeah. nightmare. Well, it was a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm, let's be frank. <laughs> good, good cop, bad cop. Uh, from the first day we shot, I always thought that film was going to be really good and really because it was felt like a really interesting pitch of an interesting story and a very, you know, lovely pitch of sense of humor. I always thought that was going to mm -hmm. be successful. We saw it. It was an yeah. anniversary screening in New York well, a yeah. few years ago now. And it was, they struck a new print. And the first time that we'd seen it for years and years. And I thought, God, the audience loved it. It was yeah. really great. Yeah, they were yeah. falling apart. And I was too. I thought, this is a really good film. Yeah. Um, yeah and uh, it felt like it from the get go. But it was kind of odd when when the boys got the money to do it. It was like, we had to shoot in uh, July, August, height mm -hmm. of summer. Mm -hmm. And I was expecting, the way it was written, I was expecting we would shoot in Texas or something, somewhere kind of dry and, you know. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, tax breaks, no, we got to shoot mm -hmm. in, you know, Mississippi. <laughs> okay, great. Um, but you want it brown and desaturated and look like a hand tinted painting and yet we're shooting in Mississippi in midsummer, which is probably the greenest place out of side outside of Ireland, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so then we we went into sort of testing how we were gonna um treat the colour. And I was working with Bev Wood at Deluxe and we were going through enormous numbers of overlays and different processing to try and get this this a uh, look that we liked um and it, it just was getting too complicated 
and it was getting silly. I thought, well, there's no way we can go there. And then Joel actually said one day, well, have you thought going digital? I thought coming from Joel, that was really yeah. weird, right, at that time. <laughs> and now he loves digital. But back then it was like, really? And But ple we heard about Pleasantville using the technique on some, some stuff. And some, yeah, some of their shots. And commercials had been obviously treated a little bit like that. So we did a few tests. I shot some shots in Griffiths Park. And we did some tests of selecting the greens and trying to push them. And it, it, um, most of it didn't work, but <laughs> one shot did. <laughs> and uh, I was talking to Joel and Ethan. They said, well, yeah, but we always have like, you know, we have a, always have a year from start of shoot to end of product, end of, you know, delivering the film. Um, so by that time, surely technology will have gone on. <laughs> enough that you'll be all right right Talk about a gamble so it was a gamble mm -hmm. it was a gamble um but when we did get to the post it was 12 weeks work it because it was very early days and work. the negative was actually wrapped up yeah and you'd go through it and you'd go through it and then yeah. the machine would crash so the last week was just gone so yeah, you have was to one, start yeah. again the one time the we spent a whole week on one reel yeah. And as James said, you rock and roll the negative mm. and it doesn't get laid down till you've got made a final pass. And I don't understand it, but <laughs> <laughs> you can't save it. And so it crashed and we lost the whole week's work. So that's partly why so it took 12 weeks. <laughs> at the end of the process, Roger said, I will never do another DI again. Yeah. <laughs> well, that changed. In fact, I never did another film finish again, I don't think. But anyway, yeah, yeah really. No, it was very difficult, but it was thrilling, actually. I mean, <laughs> if you like the funniest or... thing was watching dailies because we would sit in, uh, oh, yeah. you know, Mississippi, Canton or somewhere where we had a, day, a screening room set up. And, you know, the actors would come in, George would come in, whoever would come in. It was all like, that's the way they work. It was a lot of fun. And, you know, we would trape through the bayou and George... Clooney would be carrying the tripod. You know, it was that kind of shoot. They always are. It's fantastic. Anyway, we're all watching dailies and Joel's saying, I don't know why we're watching. It's not going to look like this. It's all green. It's not going to look like this. I'm going, no, I hope not. Oh, my God. Because <laughs> we shot it without filtration. We shot it really clean and saturated so that then we could select the colors from the image later digitally. You know, because we've tested using, you know, amber filters or whatever to push it slightly in the direction we wanted to go. But then you didn't have enough separation or you didn't have as much separation. So we, we shot it really clean and it looked really horrible. <laughs> and what's interesting is that there have been a couple of DVDs and everything that have come out without your looking at them and yeah, the no, color again, wasn't yeah. right. Yeah. So they when they... I, I, I don't know if it was Criterion or what was doing no, a Blu-ray so. and called us in. Yeah. And um, we got the opportunity to work on it with the new technology, which was uh, really it, great. It took two days, didn't it? Still took a couple two of days. days. Yeah, two whole days, <laughs> not 12 weeks. But it was funny because, yeah, yeah, because none of the kind of corrections seemed to be on that no. new file they had. It all seemed like it skewed toward it, natural color, yeah, which yeah. is very weird. Yeah. But I don't know. Has it but been it fascinating? That yeah. Has it been fascinating watching that technology evolve? I mean, you look at, I mean, I know you didn't shoot it, but like the Ballad of Buster Scruggs and just how significantly yeah. you can change color in post production. Yeah, I, I, I must say, having just discussed Oh Brother, but it might sound odd, but I think it's overused. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, Oh Brother was a very particular look we were after. And I remember, um, Oh, what was it? There was another film done that did this similar thing about a year later. And it was really, you could, it was really pushed, but it was for a reason. They wanted to create this particular world. Mm -hmm. And and I find now people, you know, it's not just the producers saying we'll fix it in post. I mean, sometimes the cinematographers are working like that. that, that they, oh, we just have this to start with and I can do all this later in post. And I, yeah, you can, but it didn't matter on O oh Brother that it looked like a a painting sometimes. It didn't matter. In fact, when we were doing the retime, mm. I didn't want to get rid of the noise level and the fake artifacts because it was all part of it. It wanted to yeah. look like something old that was timey, yeah. old timey and yeah. yeah. 
But also, I mean, when you shoot, you shoot um, the way you want it to look. I'm not So you're not going yeah. afterwards yeah. To, to fix it, which means then in the DI process, you're just able to tweak the little things because you're not having to fix stuff because you shot it the way you wanted to. Yeah, I'm, I'm maybe old fashioned. I know you've got so you much think? you can yeah, do, it really. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we get on so well. <laughs> but I, I do think there's an overuse of the technology. But it's like all technology and filmmaking. It's like when Steadicam came out, it was overused. Yeah. Um, and now a lot of movies and all this is overused, which is funny coming from me seeing the last thing I did was 1917. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the exception proves the rule. <laughs> no, but there's a time and place for, for, for everything, really. And I think the more you can more you can visualize what you want before you get on the set and the more you can get that on your negative be it film or digital and also just practically because it's the same thing when we used to do film you want the print to look the way you want yeah, it to yeah. look because they're going to live with that for six yeah. months and you might say well that's really blue i, I didn't want it yeah. that blue well at the end of those six months when they finish cutting they'll say but we really like that blue because they yeah. lived with it for six months yeah. so you want to give them what you think it should be yeah it was funny though we did a film with marty scorsese kundun yeah. right mm -hmm. and at the end, you know, in, in post, you just let me get on with the timing. Mm -hmm. And he came in when I'd finished the timing and we sat there watching it. I'm nervous as a kitten, but he didn't he didn't say anything while he was screening it. And right at the end, he said, yeah, OK, look, look great. But there's a shot of the kid like, I don't know, 10, 10, five minutes into the film. There's a shot of a kid and it's uh, the kid waking up and it's it's kind of blue gray and that was always green. And I said, oh, oh dear, I thought that might happen. I said, I was gonna get reprinted to be what it is in the, what I've just done. But uh, I thought, oh, that's all right. It's a bit green. I won't bother getting it reprinted. <laughs> and he said, oh, is that what you meant? And I said, yeah, it's no big deal if you like it the way it was. He said, no, it's no big deal if it's the way you want it to be, that's fine. But he said, I just got used to it being green. So, you know, it's even mm -hmm. somebody, you know, yeah. So I try and get everything as close as possible. And I, I think also in this day and age too, when there's so much visual effect work being done afterwards, it's really important that you expose correctly. Oh, yeah. So you're not having to correct for that and that you're giving them a reference as to what you want it to look like. So it's even more important yeah, now. Especially on like something like 1917, mm. there's so much, very subtle effects work in the film or all, mm. all through the film but subtle stuff but if it hadn't you know if, if they hadn't been working on something that was really close to the final look of the image that that would have been a real mess yeah. wouldn't it yeah yeah well, and kind of to that point, around the same time you did A Brother, you did The Man Who Wasn't There, which I think is one of the most underrated films uh, that you guys have done together with uh, the Coen brothers and everything. I was wondering what it was like to shoot, you know, old fashioned black and white and to create a noir. Because you're something that, you know, something that I think is really nice about kind of your signature, if you can call it that, is the way you frame silhouettes. And there are just so many beautiful shots in that film. Yeah, I love doing that. I mean, I wish. You know, it was actually a few years later, Joel and Ethan were talking about doing a horror film that was being black and white, and that, but it never happened, which was a shame. Oh, well. You uh, need to say that that was not shot in black and white. No, but a, a man who wasn't there wasn't shot in black and white. We didn't, we didn't actually want the look of an old noir film. And that yeah. was the thing, you know. We did a lot of tests in, on, on double X and, you know, plus X and that. I didn't really want that look. Um, and then with again with Beverly Wood at Deluxe, we did a lot of testing of shooting different color negatives and going through different inter internegs, interposes mm. to get to a, a, a black and white we liked. And um, we came up with a system that we could start with a, a low contrast color stock and go through a high contrast sound stock i think it was mm -hmm. yeah. and then print on a title stock yeah which is a very strange combination but this was only for the show prints only for the show mm -hmm. prints yeah um 
That's no, the show prints came directly off the neg right. onto the title so, stock, right? Yes. And then the other way, we okay, went through yeah, right, an, right, a, yeah. a different yeah. IP, INIP. So we got all that, but in the end, we had to shoot it on a color stock because the distribution rights, in order to get finance, they got sold some distribution rights in Europe and they insisted on a color version. Uh, I mean, yeah. in the end, we it was, you know, a VHS or whatever. In the end, we did a color version that's very, very muted and it wasn't too bad. I, I know some people have seen it, but I, it's not what we wanted at all. But, um, but <clears throat> no, basically, we went a direction shooting on color negative so we could get something that was far less, had far less grain than a traditional black and white stock. Um, and you know, it was we shot on a 200 ASA stock, so it was pretty good uh, exposure range. So yeah. The funny story about that is, um, you know, in the lab sometimes you do you're checking a machine or something, and you run a reel through. So they'd run a reel through on color stock just um, to check things. Okay. And <laughs> so when sadly they didn't throw that away so i know in chicago at one point there was a screening you know a regular screening where reel four they had shipped a color reel there so of course they the audience saw the whole screening and went i wonder why the cohen's decided to go to color on that reel oh, was, <laughs> joel, joel said he was interviewed one one time by a chicago critic and they said, yeah, it was really great, but why did you go to color at that particular <laughs> moment in the movie? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, really. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I, one of my favorite films of all time, I think one of the you know most beautifully shot films ever made is The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. Um, it's just incredible. I revisited it recently. Uh, you know, it, it's like a kind of like a tone poem of a Western, really. What was your experience on that one? It, it felt like you kind of, um, I don't know, there's an elegance to it, but maybe a little more freedom to, it feels very inspired by like Days of Heaven, a little kind of Terrence Malicky. Yeah, it might. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, that was inspired by the book. I don't know if you ever read the book. I mean, the book is like a tone poem. Um, you know, I've been very lucky to do a number of westerns and then very lucky to work on a film like Kundun and then Assassin Assassination, which are like tone poems. I mean, they have strong stories, but um, they're, they're, yeah, somehow they transcend that in, in my feeling anyway, and they become more akin to sort of poetry, really. And so that that was uh, that was a wonderful opportunity for me. Um, conceptually andrew dominic i mean i don't know why andrew dominic hasn't done more films than terry malick or whatever i mean i don't i don't understand it i mean maybe he's a difficult character i won't say he's not but he's an absolute genius and he was so committed on this film to make mm. it as best he could i mean we would argue i mean i'm not not going to deny that we argue but we both had a passion for it and the argument was always something that both of us were trying to find and uh you know i just think that was uh that was i, I do love that film I, um brad was wonderful in it mm. casey was wonderful in it i mean it was it was tough i mean some some days we would do I mean, we would do, uh, some days I felt I was shooting with Kubrick or something. <laughs> Not that I ever have, but it was so many takes. And you're going, he's walking through a door. <laughs> 90. No, it was that kind of thing. But I could see what Andrew was trying to get. And, and you knew that he had something in his mind that he was trying to get. And uh, it was, it was, yeah, it was a pretty wonderful experience. And I think all, that in the budget we were always chasing the mm. budget i think it went way over and uh, and there was a lot of pressure and andrew must have been un under enormous pressure um but he kept going and he stuck to it and said no this is what i want you know and the result is the movie um my only regret about the movie is the first cut that i saw was probably an hour longer than the final cut that was released and and given that the film 
wasn't successful at the box office, I think it would have just as well been unsuccessful an hour longer, <laughs> which I thought was a better film. You know, it had it had far more uh, far more kind of delving into the different characters and what mm. happened to them at the end of the story. Like you went with Frank James to his farm in up on, in the in the northeast. I don't know, Maine or somewhere. He had a farm anywhere up there, and he would take tourists around his farm <laughs> to earn money. You know, tourists going around the farm of this great, you know, bank Bandit. robber. You know, ban- <laughs> I mean, it was just really interesting. Yeah, um, you know, lots of things like that, but that was cut out, which I, I was I think was a shame. I, I mean, as you said, I think Brad is incredible in that film, and I, I think you know it's also kind of a film about celebrity. Were there, were there discussions of kind of the framing of Brad? I mean, it, I think it's it, the film uses Brad Pitt as like Brad Pitt well, because, you know, Jesse yeah. James is this iconographic yeah. figure yeah. Um, yeah. You know, played by his demons. How did that kind of uh, translate to kind of how you were framing up those shots with him? Well, I mean, framing was just something we kind of worked. There's an opening sequence where it's talking Brad standing in the sunset in a cornfield and there's a spider that he puts his cigar on and all this. And that was just something we did on pre-shoot day and made it up. Mm. And, you know, so a lot of it was like that. But the whole, the feel of the film, the concept of the film was on the corridor in the production office building. It was a long corridor, went on forever past all the art department production department and by the time we come to shoot the all whole wall was images they might have been polaroids that andrew had taken they might have been something i'd stolen from a magazine they might have been a still image from a movie the whole corridor was like the movie that he wanted to make all the color palette, all the kind of feel of each scene all the way down if you walk the corridor you could walk the film (laughs) <laughs> and all the kind of little vignettes of the, you know, the the tricky vignette thing we did with the lens and all that. And uh, the original photographs that we were trying to match of of Jesse James in the morgue and all the journalists. Uh, it was it was really wonderful that you were creating something that was actually real. But as I say in this kind of very. I know, mythical way, I suppose. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I love the film. Yeah, that movie's incredible. Um, I definitely wanted to ask about, you know, In Time and Skyfall and working with digital, not if digital is better than film, but kind of how the advent of digital cameras and digital photography may have changed your workflow um, or maybe um, made things a little easier for you or even opened up new avenues that previously were not accessible to you. I don't know if it's changed it. Really. I, well, the one thing that you always say is that um, the fact that you can show the director exactly yeah. what it is that you're shooting is really important because you, in the past, you would say, okay, well, they're going to be in silhouette for the shot. Mm-hmm. Is that okay? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they see the dailies and go, but I can't see their face. Yeah. So at least you're able to show them yeah. um, exactly what they're getting. But then we tend to run it on the set exactly like a film set. Mm-hmm. We don't keep the camera rolling and rolling and rolling. We Sometimes just, a director will, but yeah. I mean, only specific circumstances. But I mean, Sam, Sam did a few things on 1917 just because everybody was there and doing it. It was like reset, reset. Mm-hmm. Um, and you understand that makes sense, especially there where we were shooting in the cloud mm. and trying to get things in during the right light. But um, but generally, yeah, we just work exactly as it was a film shoot. Uh, I think that's the trick, really, because... The thing about film, it's not inherent to actually celluloid, but it's the idea that everybody's working to that moment, that special moment when everything's got to come together. You know, the performance, the the staging, the camera, the lighting, you know, the effects, everything has to be focused on that one little piece of film. But it might just as well be noughts and ones. Who cares? It's that moment in time, you know. It's, so it's not integral to the actual process um the actual material you're using or whatever you're mm-hmm. using to capture the image it's it's just the way of of focusing you know that's really i think really important if you're doing 99 takes and keeping the camera rolling how do you remember i mean 
you know, how many times is it is what people say about Stanley Kruger? How many times did he use take one when he did 90 takes or something? A lot, yeah. apparently, you know. But but also, for instance, when we were Can't doing remember. Prisoners, which was a relatively one of our first digital, um, there was a time when Denis asked, it was a short line, but asked the yeah, yeah, actor yeah. to do it again yeah. and again and again. But then when we were just checking dailies, they thought, oh, it's not there. It, it, we, we didn't get that one variation. So I had to sit through it and go through those long takes. So I hate those long takes <laughs> just because we were also new Find enough one, yeah. to think, oh, maybe it didn't get transferred. I don't know yeah, how yeah, that yeah, would yeah, happen. Right, but, right. you know, I had to go through and double check that we did have it. So That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if it was Jake Gyllenhaal, I mean, he worked with Fincher, so I'm sure he has. Yeah, <laughs> but it's interesting. Everybody's got a different way of working. Like we were yeah. joking about Joel and Ethan mm -hmm. doing two t two takes, but only because mm -hmm. I would often ask for the second one. Yeah. In <laughs> sometimes they do fifteen or twenty, but probably more so in the on the later films I work with them than the earlier ones. And then maybe that come from their, you know, low budget, self, you know, financing things that they were very meticulous about how much stock they shot i mean fargo was shot on 150,000 feet of film <laughs> 150,000 feet of film well That's what was the last mission impossible yeah. two and a half million <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I know they're different movies but come on guys <laughs> um, but but then you know you work with directors that shoot a lot of takes you know I mean, sam shoots quite a lot of takes you know it just people got a different way of working yeah does that uh, you know um, working in post-production, does that then kind of uh, affect kind of your process? You said you're having to sit through all those dailies. How does that, um, you know, when you're working with Sam Mendes versus working with the Coen brothers, is that process in post-production quite different? Well, in the dailies portion, um, Sam will have chosen his takes. So um, he'll have selects, uh, four or five selects. So I just check those. Mm -hmm. um, and then if there's a question, about that i mean and of course the editor is watching it too so he also can check back and see if there's um something else but if there's a a question on something technical do we have a take without something then i'll just go back and check that setup but normally when there's a lot of takes i'll look at selects what the director liked and um just double check them well, yeah. Although the timer's yeah. checking everything. But. Yeah, Sam's very meticulous about choosing takes. Mm -hmm. I mean, he might shoot 20 takes maybe. I think one, one set up on 1917, we got up to 45 takes, but he only selected three or four. Mm -hmm. he, he Maybe not even that. He wanted to have a really good one and then a backup. Yeah. Um, so sometimes it took, you know, you got the first take, the first take he was happy with might be take 10 or 12, and then you do a whole lot to get to another one, which is fair enough. You weren't doing anything else that day. so <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then Lee had all the takes because. Yeah. Yeah. Um, had everything. So yeah. He could watch it later. But mm. yeah. Yeah. I spoke to Lee. He said he loves puzzles. So he. Ended yeah. Up <laughs> invariably, it, the, I, I think. Uh, it's true to say invariably that used take would be one that Sam had chosen on the day. Oh yeah. Pretty well invariably. Yeah. Because again, it was they were they were so long and had to so many elements had to be right that it was you know you couldn't just um, say oh I'll use that take and use the front of this and the end of the next. You know, in the yeah. next setup, you couldn't cut around something. So. And of, oftentimes we were shooting the next one the next day, so they had yeah, to yeah. pick it that night yeah. and know, okay, this is the, the take we're matching to. Yeah. Seems a long time ago now, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was your reaction when Sam first told you that was a one-shot movie? <laughs> I, he, didn't, he didn't tell us in so many words. He just sent a script. He said, I'm doing a film set in the First World War. And, I mean, I was just... One, I was so pleased that he rang me because uh, I hadn't worked with him on Vector. And and he just sent me the script. I mean, I just, the First World War, it's always been obviously really interesting. I'm British after all. And and it was the on the title page of the script. You know, this is envisioned in real time as a single take. 
And we kind of looked at each other and go, well, really? We didn't believe sure? it. <laughs> no, I thought, I thought it was just a way of selling it or something to the studio. Yeah, right. I don't know. I don't know what I thought. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, talking to him after I read it, um, it was very obvious what he was trying to achieve by it. And it, it you know, made, made a lot of sense. I mean, his concept of it, concept of it was, well, what you see, you know, which I think is yes, fair enough. But did it end up being harder than you may have envisioned or or somewhat easier or you know in it ended up in a, it ended up being a lot longer than i envisioned we spent a lot longer prepping it but that was because i wasn't doing anything else and i didn't want to do anything else so we we spent we went over to england early we 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 work, work with storyboard artists early and um was a lot of prep but in terms of the actual shoot, I think most of it was actually easier than I yeah. expected. I, I think the prep was mm -hmm. harder because the prep, the prep was, yeah. was, okay, how do we do this? And mm -hmm. and then figure out, they figured it out first, what they wanted to see, s s not thinking how to make it. So yeah. then we, we know what he wants to see and then how the hell do we do this? And yeah. we don't know because we didn't know a lot of these rigs and everything, so a lot of testing yeah. rigs. But then once we got it down and we had our schematics down and we knew where the camera was going yeah. and we knew which rig it was, when we went there on the day, it was generally sunny in the morning, so we'd rehearse it a couple of times and everybody knew where we were at. And then we'd wait for the clouds and and it was amazingly easy because everybody knew what we were doing. Again, it was that that focus, or also the mm -hmm. focus, because we had to shoot in the yeah. cloud. It was yes. a focus on knowing exactly what you were going to do. Mm -hmm. and, Which um, also meant you could not go to the loo on set yeah. because they always put the bathroom so far away, and you never knew it when big, the cloud was coming beef, in. That, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, it was. <laughs> I but I think it was. I've never. I don't think I've. I remember. I don't think I remember being on a film where had so much time never been on a film with so much time with the main actors and yeah. that was key to it in prep but, yeah by the time we got to the shot we were so in sync you know about the staging and it wasn't like the actors weren't thinking about the camera they could just do what they wanted to do with that character development and and we would everything was in sync because we had rehearsed it so many times to get a get over the technical challenge of it but as james said when we first, when Sam and I first started talking about it, it was like, okay, we're not going to discuss how we do it. We're going to discuss what we want to do. Where do we want the camera to be? Do we just want to walk behind them the whole time? No. How are we going to make this, explain the world, describe the world, but also, you know, um, heighten, express the, the, the storyline? How are we going to bring it out in some, you know, interesting but you know stylistic way that doesn't get in the way of the story you know like you always do um we didn't talk about oh we'll have to do this on a wire or we'll have to do this blah 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 you know um it was only later then when we figured what what we wanted to do with the camera that i i would go through it and with james and we talked about okay well this section needs to be on this kind of rig and then we got a change somewhere because we need to be on a wire to go over the crater or whatever. And it was then I went back to Sam with this sort of like schematic of where we needed to change rigs. And sometimes I thought just in terms of physically doing the shot, you know, if it was a shot on a steady cam or a Trinity, I thought, well, you know, I'm sorry, the best operator in the world is not going to walk down that trench for you know, half an hour, even mm. if you, you know, okay. even if you had the extras and the staging to do it, some of it was just okay. We got to, we got to make it manageable. You know, but mainly it was because of uh, changing and rigs and techniques. So. so we'd break it down into segments, and then we would bring the actors in before anything had been built and run it with them to see where we needed like a little side trench or something for the camera yeah. to move around, how long the trench needed to be. Because we didn't go back and reuse any portion of the, the trench. We had to build yeah. all of those. Yeah. So having the actors and then Roger would be running along with a little um, point and shoot camera and 
taking the frames that he wanted. So afterwards on the schematics, we were able for the people that were holding the camera to say at this point in the trench, we want a close up of George or whatever to give them as much information as possible. Yeah, it was a good way of doing it. We, yeah, as James said, we had a schematic of like an overhead view of what the camera was going to do. And then we had these frames printed out to show what the frame wanted to be, you know, the mm -hmm. balance of the characters in the frame. So <clears throat> it was really um, a good way to, I mean, in one, one shot we had like, I think it was probably 20 grips on a camera car driver and stuff, you know, working on the shot. So it was a great way of describing what we wanted at what point, you know. And when we actually shot it, Roger was operating remotely and I was on the headset with whoever was carrying the um, camera because they didn't have a monitor to see how close they were or whether they were slightly left or something and just saying to them, okay, get in a little bit tighter, move a little bit, you know, yeah. away or whatever. Um, so we had this whole communication going yeah. during a shot. It was, yeah, it was really great. It's very, <laughs> I was going to say it's different, but it wasn't that different from any film, but it was, it was a great experience. It really was. Yeah, sounds like fantastic. It happened before all this nonsense, but anyway, <laughs> really lucky. Um, but yeah, go back to your original question, which was about digital. You know, <laughs> but that is a film. I don't see how you could have possibly done it on film. You know, yeah. you know. So that's that's the thing about digital technology. It's not about whether it should be film or digital. I don't really care. I mean, I've, there's some great films made on an iPhone. It's just whatever feels right for that particular project. And, you know, we couldn't have done that kind of technique with a film camera in the way. Yeah. I was curious. I mean, 1970 comes on the heels of you doing um, these really big films like Skyfall and Blade Runner 2049. Um, how did you find working on, on those kinds of projects where you're working on, you know, large scale visual effects, these massive beloved franchises? So, you know, you know, Obviously, the studio is is looking very closely at what's going on. Yeah, but you know, on both occasions, well, I, I when Sam originally originally rang me up about Skyfall, he first first thing he said, I mean, he knows me very well. <laughs> damn it, he he said the first thing is, don't put the phone down. <laughs> hear he me said, out. Hear me out. <laughs> don't put the phone down. Hear me out, and I'm gonna I'm gonna be in LA soon, and we can talk. And we were in Australia, weren't we? I don't I know. I think we somewhere. were in Santa Fe. Oh, yeah. we were doing something. Mm -hmm. And I go, okay, a Bond movie. I don't even like Bond movies. <laughs> I mean, I don't. It's not, you know. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I probably shouldn't say that. But no, that's fair. They're, you know, on the whole. They acquired taste. I mean, you know, I watched one in an afternoon as a kid and think, yeah, that's kind of silly. That's fine. But the way Sam wanted to do it was nothing like a Bond movie. It wasn't. Yeah. It was a very particular take on a, okay, it was part of a franchise which was interesting that you take this character and then you use what that what comes with that character to tell a story that is kind of a little bit more um, darker and much more goes places where a normal Bond movie wouldn't go, right? <laughs> and so I was sold on that. And I, the other hesitation I had was yeah, the idea, it's a big movie, so we'll have lots of cameras and lots of camera units and all that. And he said, no, you put the camera on shoulder and we'll shoot it like we did Jarhead. I don't care. We'll just do it how we want to do it. And that's the way we did it. I mean, obviously, there's scenes where we had five cameras. There's one, there was one scene where we had 11 cameras. Was that in Turkey, though? No, that was that was um, the subway the car, subway car yeah, going yeah. through the roof. We had eleven mm -hmm. cameras on it. Mm -hmm. Only one was operated. That was me. Mm -hmm. And and then oh, yeah, we had a second unit <clears throat> working in Turkey for weeks and weeks. Alexander Witt did fantastic work, but we we were watching the dailies all the time, Sam and I. And it wasn't some of it wasn't exactly what we wanted. We'd storyboard the whole scene, so we wanted exactly what we had in our minds. And we ended up at the end of schedule shooting quite a bit with Daniel anyway, so we could do it again anyway. Um, but it was all mapped out. So it wasn't like it was a second unit going off and just doing their thing. It was a very structured sequence, that opening, the opening sequence. So, yeah, it wasn't it was bigger, but it wasn't any different shooting another movie 
Well, it was kind of the same too with Blade Runner. Um, yeah. The, the yeah. Uh, line producer expected us to need nine cameras and we kept saying no no we don't we don't we don't and they, he just didn't believe that no, yeah, and right. the same thing it, with bond they kept saying well don't you need five or six <laughs> um, yeah he, he, they said at one point in prep they said well we we need a list now of the the four or five camera crews you want because we have to get um you know visas whatever i don't know mm -hmm. why and we said, well, what, four or five? And they actually, no. I know that they didn't believe we could do it with one <laughs> camera. Absolutely not. And then, you know, we did. But it's always like that. I mean, I thought that was strange, given that I, we'd worked with Denny before and quite successfully, I felt. Yeah, and, yeah. But... Um, but it's always like that with production, or oh, often. That always is extreme. Well, it's I'm the, exaggerating. The that, bigger movies, especially. I remember one of the first films I did, 1984. It was probably my third movie. Sure, nobody knew me, but I worked with Mike on documentaries and television stuff. But the, the line producer, I was a production manager, and together. They hired a second unit crew <laughs> for the whole shoot. This was a low budget film. The whole shoot, they had this crew on standby. It was standby because it wasn't what Mike wanted or I wanted. It wasn't some second unit shoots. In the final film, there's only three shots or so that they ever shot. They were on standby because the line producer didn't think I could shoot the film and operate the camera. And he didn't know who I was. But that's always a question, too, in the beginning. Yeah. Is, oh, so how long should our second <clears throat> unit be? And it's always, well, yeah. we may not need a second unit because we can do a splinter group. We're sending one, one of our guys off or we'll pick it up at the end of the day. Just trying not to yeah. split it up that way. Which is what, you know, Joel and Ethan are really great at mm -hmm. doing. You know, always find a way of <clears throat> splitting it up or shoot on a Saturday so we could be there with, you know, a small crew or something that's that's the way yeah does that factor into kind of your decision making process now and in, in terms of i mean i imagine you're offered so many different kinds of films um, I'm not really people think that but it's yeah. i've read a script for months i mean yes, i have, have well, right? well, a couple, but, you know, but though they were so bad yeah, i haven't yes. read them because they were so bad i didn't get through yes it but, does figure yeah. in because if somebody yeah. says oh yeah well we'll just put six cameras on it and you know that that way we'll get through the scene. No, thanks. It's sloppy, isn't it? I mean, you know, a, why should a bigger film be any different than a smaller film? I, I that's no, we have this sort of way of working, and that's it. I mean, and you say, I go back to Blade Runner. I mean, that was basically a single camera, wasn't it? Oh, it was. Yeah, yeah. and it's not like. It, it's actually sometimes slower to have a lot of cameras because then you have to talk to all of them and you have to say where they are while you could get three or four shots done in that same time period and, and get the angles that you need. Yeah. And you also think about what angles a lot, a lot more. Yeah, that's always something. I mean, all the films that I really love, well, 99% of the films I really love have been made by directors that you know, like Jean-Pierre Melville or Tarkovsky or something, and it's a very deliberate way of working. They have they have a concept of what they want, and it, this shot goes for this section, and this shot goes for this section. That's mm. that's the way I like to work. That's not to say I don't also like making it up on the day. Like I've done enough films like Sid and Nancy or something where you know, or Jarhead, where it's handheld and you're making it on the day, but it's still. You're working towards that bit of film that that encaptures that piece of mo that piece of time. It's not like you're shooting coverage, you know. Yeah. Well, what about your work uh, in animation? I mean, you, there are so many different. Um, there's a long time that you can have to change things, or you know, change where things go. <laughs> it's <awful. laughs> That's terrible. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, you've worked on some incredible films like Rango and Wally, -E and the How to Train Your Dragon films. I think are, are fantastic. What's kind of that work process it's there? It's very you different. Think? You know, I, I'm, I'm. We work kind of consulting. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, it's, it's, it's not the same as when I'm cinematographer on a live action movie. You work with a whole whole lot of people. I mean, um, most of them we started at the beginning, and we talk with a director, the 
conceptualizing the look of the film and doing the same thing as like getting visual references and uh, art director, production designer would make a whole color scheme and and you know, we talk sets with people and that's it. And so it's, in that sense, it's the same. But in terms of actually the shots and the lighting, I'm, I'm much more reactive to what something is somebody is 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 working on really. You know, I, it's usually a case like now we're we're kind of involved on a film, and it's it's like it's more reactive to what some somebody has done for a scene in terms of the layout of the shots, and then a different department does the lighting, and I sort of react to it and say, well, maybe that shot's a little. What if you did this, or do we have to move the camera, or should we move the camera? You know, it's that kind of relationship. I mean, especially was on on. Rango, because I was shooting uh, True, True Grit, Grit wasn't yeah. it? I was, True Grit. So I was working everything remotely, and and we'd done a lot of testing. We I'd done a lot of. We spent a lot of time up at uh, ILM, who did it, um, ILM in San Francisco, um, with Tim Alexander, doing a lot of tests for different looks, like night in the desert, the look of Rango himself. We did a whole lot of tests on the color and the kind of lighting that would best work for that animated character. Um, but they say, then I was off on doing live action and I would just have a remote connection and, and, and look and at stuff. I think what you did too is you took a couple of frames sometimes yeah. and brought it into Photoshop, Photoshop yeah. and just sort of visually showed what he was talking about and then sent it on. Yeah, most of it was kind of laid out in that pre-production kind of time and then you know each scene I would they would send stuff and it was it was only one time where Gore rang up and said look it's a real problem the bar is not working the bar just looks like nothing and I don't understand why it's not working and we really and they really need somebody here working on it. and I said well can't you just I'll talk to them and they send me some stuff and that was when I did a whole lot mm. of photoshop work on some on some frames and started putting in the idea of these streaks of light and stuff that um then it it just worked the guys the guys took that and ran with it really so two westerns at once yeah yeah that's true yeah. yeah two very different ones yeah so. different. yeah yeah, yeah. Hey, i mean lovely. i mean i love that the thing about the animation sorry but interrupt but it's like um, I love that relationship, especially on that with Tim and then with the guys that he was working with. And OK, it's all remote, but I mean, a lot of these people are working. They're in Canada or Montreal or London or mm. somewhere. And, you know, just to be able to work with them over the Internet now and just swap ideas. It's really great. It's fun. It keeps me connected when uh, when I'm not doing live action as well. Yeah. Well, I, I can't thank you guys enough uh, for talking to me today and uh, for putting up with my million questions. Uh, no, I can no, no, no. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and thank you for joining us. Please go to rogerdeacons.com. Uh, you know, they're there answering questions. Uh, you can find all kinds of information there. That's a really fantastic resource. Um, and yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation with, you know, the greatest cinematographer who's ever lived. So. <laughs> well, thank you, Adam. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Very kind. <laughs> Keizu Miyagawa. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. And uh, you know, tune in to uh, Collider's YouTube channel and go to collider.com for uh, all your high impact entertainment news. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.